Hello, my name is Eric Kazarian. I am an otolaryngologist, head and neck surgeon, sometimes known as an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and one of the relatively few surgeons in the world that specializes in the surgical evaluation and treatment of snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. In this video, I will discuss drug-induced sleep endoscopy, an evaluation I use often in the selection of treatments, including surgery, for my patients with obstructive sleep apnea. Drug-induced sleep endoscopy has been a main focus of my entire career in an area where surgeons around the world consider me an expert. This is based on my experience as well as multiple published research studies in this area. With some European colleagues, I actually renamed the procedure as drug-induced sleep endoscopy and developed the VOTE classification system. This is the standard way that we describe what we see during drug-induced sleep endoscopy and take the findings to improve the results of surgery and oral appliances. I will share some example sleep endoscopy videos to provide a sense of what we can see in this evaluation. Sleep endoscopy can have an important role in procedure selection, and my expertise in procedure selection in drug-induced sleep endoscopy is one of the main reasons that patients come to see me. I hope you enjoy this video, the other videos, and my website where you can find more information about the surgical evaluation treatment of snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. Although I am board certified both in otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and in sleep medicine, the main reason patients see me is because they are thinking about surgery if they are snoring or if they have sleep apnea are not doing well with CPAP or positive airway pressure therapy. When I see patients with obstructive sleep apnea or snoring, my focus is on answering this not so simple question, what is the best treatment for you? The short answer is that no single treatment is best for everyone. Getting the best results for my patients with sleep apnea or snoring is not just my experience in performing surgeries often, but more importantly, the ability to perform a wide range of procedures. Next, there are many studies that indicate that sleep surgery and oral appliances only work if you treat all factors that contribute to sleep apnea or snoring. The goal is to do everything we can to select the right treatment for each patient. Each patient is different, so I work to make decisions with my patients about what might work best for them. If you have reviewed my website or other videos, you have probably seen this picture showing the three regions of the breathing passages that can play a role in sleep apnea and snoring. My evaluation is based on this idea that I want to know whether a certain patient needs treatment of what I call the nasal, palate, or tongue regions, and often of more than just one of them. In a previous video on the selection of surgical procedures, I discussed my office evaluation that includes a careful history, physical examination, and flexible endoscopy. Flexible endoscopy is an examination with a flexible telescope that allows me to look inside the nose and throat in a more detailed way than I can with simple instruments like tongue depressors. Here you can see how the telescope is passed through the nose to look at the entire breathing pathway from the nose to the voice box or larynx. For many patients, this is enough to develop a treatment plan, as you can tell a fair amount about what is causing their sleep apnea or snoring, even while a patient is awake in the office. However, sometimes in patients with sleep apnea, we need more information about what might be happening when a patient is asleep. I joke with patients that I could bring my flexible telescope to their home and place it inside their nose and throat to watch them all night long while they sleep, but nobody really wants that. Instead, we perform a procedure called drug-induced sleep endoscopy that involves going to the operating room where a patient can receive sedation so that they drift off, similar to what happens when they are sleeping, and then I put the telescope into their nose and throat. The patient is still breathing on their own, but they are just more comfortable and can tolerate the flexible telescope without waking up because they are sedated. The purpose of drug-induced sleep endoscopy is to determine where blockage in breathing is occurring so that we can improve the selection of treatments. The reason this makes sense is that there are a couple of well-done studies showing that if you give the sedation properly, there are many similarities to natural sleep. In 2011, I developed the VOTE classification system with two European surgeons, 
and it has become the standard way to describe findings of drug-induced sleep endoscopy for surgeons around the world. The letters that spell out vote refer to the four main structures that play a role in blocking breathing in the throat. V is for velum, a Latin term that refers to the soft palate or the back of the roof of the mouth. O stands for the oropharyngeal lateral walls, the sides of the throat. T is for tongue, and E is the epiglottis, a piece of cartilage in the throat that covers the voice box when you swallow so that food and liquids do not go down the wrong way into the lungs. The vote classification requires making a judgment about whether there is none, partial, or complete blockage of the space for breathing related to each of these structures, and especially for the soft palate, what direction that blockage is occurring. We need to look at all the structures because often more than one structure causes blockage in breathing in a single patient. During sleep, the muscles in the body relax. This allows structures surrounding the throat to collapse and block breathing in patients with obstructive sleep apnea. Drug-induced sleep endoscopy focuses on the throat, both in the palate region and the tongue region. Because different people have different patterns of blockage and breathing, I'm going to show some videos with examples of the different kinds of findings I see. These videos can be a little confusing, as the view is going to be different than what you see when you open your mouth and look inside. For example, in the palate region, you will see the soft palate, but not the front of the soft palate that you see when opening your mouth. You will actually be seeing the back of the soft palate, because that is where the flexible telescope is. There you can see if the soft palate is collapsing from front to back, side to side, or in both directions. In the tongue region, it is even more complicated because you have the other three structures in the vote classification that can cause blockage of the breathing space, and I will go through these individually with the sample videos. This video shows blockage of breathing related to the velum or soft palate. What you see on the top of the screen in this video and all the other videos is the back of the throat. The soft palate is towards the bottom of the screen and is fluttering around, vibrating and creating snoring sound as it falls backward to the throat, which is towards the top of the screen. In this patient, the blockage of breathing comes from all directions, both front to back and side to side. This is called complete concentric collapse related to the velum or soft palate. The tonsils sit within the sides of the throat and are surrounded by muscles and mucosa or lining of the throat. This patient had very enlarged tonsils that you can barely see here. These enlarged tonsils narrow the space for breathing at all times. One of the funny things in this patient occurs when the uvula pops up into view just to say hello to us. This video shows the oropharyngeal lateral walls as a source of sleep apnea. Again, the top of the image is the back of the throat, and the most obvious thing you see is the sides of the throat caving in. You can see the tongue and the epiglottis towards the bottom with the voice box or larynx in the center. If you look carefully in these two patients, you will see that the tongue and epiglottis do not move much at all, indicating that they are not blocking breathing and are not part of the problem here. In this video, you can see the back of the tongue towards the bottom of the picture, and it has a normal appearance of white dots on an irregular, bumpy surface. What is shown is repeated movement of the tongue towards the back of the throat, which is upwards on the screen, in order to block breathing. Often, a combination of these vote structures contributes to sleep apnea, and the structures can affect each other. In this example, the tongue falls backwards to block breathing and stick the epiglottis against the back of the throat. 
The tongue moves forward eventually, but it has already created this problem, leaving the epiglottis there against the back of the throat to block breathing during the rest of the breathing cycle. It certainly creates some interesting snoring sounds. In about 5% of patients, the epiglottis can cause sleep apnea on its own. In these two videos, you can see the epiglottis falling against the back of the throat, again, the top of the picture, without the tongue pushing it backwards. Drug-induced sleep endoscopy is an evaluation where experience matters. I could talk for hours about how to do it properly, and I actually have written articles and give courses to other surgeons at national and international meetings. However, in the interest of time, I will just summarize by mentioning a few key points. First, we are trying to reproduce something similar to natural sleep, so you have to make sure the level of sedation is appropriate. I have seen so many sleep endoscopy videos where the patient was either over or under sedated and it really can make the sleep endoscopy useless. Doing this carefully is essential. Second, body position can be extremely important in sleep apnea and I will typically change the patient's body position during drug-induced sleep endoscopy. This is not just tilting the head but physically involves rolling the patient on the hospital bed. Finally, we will also lift the lower jaw or mandible forward during drug-induced sleep endoscopy, looking with the endoscope to see how it opens or does not open the space for breathing. This is called the S-mark maneuver, and the purpose is to evaluate what an oral appliance might accomplish so that I can discuss this as a treatment option, either by itself or in combination with surgery. I hope you have enjoyed learning about drug-induced sleep endoscopy and the interesting example videos. Drug-induced sleep endoscopy and the entire field of sleep surgery is fascinating to me and I hope you feel the same way. I am committed to educating patients and my colleagues as well as advancing the field of sleep surgery through research. This has allowed us to be one of the world's leading centers in the surgical evaluation and treatment of snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. Please do not hesitate to contact me with any questions or if you'd like to schedule an appointment.